I have a sneaking suspicion that Instagram and TikTok would have been very dangerous for King Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> Can you imagine King Nebuchadnezzar on social media? So we have, we have here an example of an inscription that Nebuchadnezzar put on a wall about one of his buildings. This is what he said. I, Nebuchadnezzar, laid the foundation of the gates down to the ground water level and had them built out of pure blue stone. Upon the walls in the inner room of the gate are bulls and dragons. And thus I magnificently adorned them with luxurious splendor for all mankind to behold in awe. So, here are some of his actual accomplishments. You can imagine these in an Instagram post. So check out the latest on our citadel palace on the north side of the city with its large courts, reception rooms, throne room, and residences. With accompanying pictures, of course. Just gaze at our new, world-renowned, famous, terraced hanging gardens. They have their own elaborate water supply, which I built for the queen. And this would later be counted as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Or this. Take a look at our new 27-kilometer wall. It's a beautiful wall, bigger than any wall that came before it. Not just a single thin wall like those that have come before. This beautiful, huge wall is so amazing that a chariot with four horses can turn around on top of it. And that doesn't even count the inner wall, which has eight gates and has the Euphrates River coming right through it. Or, have you seen our professional avenue paved with limestone and decorated with lion figures, which comes through the Ishtar Gate, decorated with dragons and bulls? So these were all actual things that Nebuchadnezzar had built in the city of Babylon. According to the word biblical commentary, which I was reading, uh, one commentator actually has 126 pages of text and translation just of the inscriptions that Nebuchadnezzar put on all the buildings that he had built and things that he did. So based on the things he actually did, I'm imagining a couple of other uh, takes on social media so here's a shout out from the most awesome leader in the most powerful empire on earth. You might hear from him or, hey, did you see the latest updates to the Ziggurat Tower? Those, that was all me. And eventually he's going to say this, and this is a quote from our text. Is not this great Babylon, which I have built with my mighty power, as a royal residence, and for the glory of my majesty. Social media would have been dangerous for Nebuchadnezzar. But at the moment that he says that, things are going to change for him. In fact, he's going to take a seven-year break from social media at that point for his own good and for the good of the nations. So this morning, we're going to continue in our series through the book of Daniel, which we've called Faithful, God's Character, Our Calling. And we'll be in chapters 4 and 5, so just as a warning, there's a lot of text today. We're going to spend more time actually reading text together, uh, so you'll want your Bible out and open to Daniel 4 and 5. And in both of these chapters, we're going to see several things that are common to both. We're going to see egregious sins against God. We're going to see some revelation from God to confront these sins. We're going to see some interpretation of this revelation from God and warning from the prophet Daniel. And then we'll see their response. And where the two paths are going to diverge significantly is the result of chapter 4 and the result of chapter 5. Where they end up is going to be very different, but the pattern is very similar throughout the text. And there are several key lessons that I hope that we can learn uh, as we read through these two chapters today and consider what God's Word says to us. Some moral lessons, some things about our own attitudes and spiritual condition. 
But I don't want us to miss, as we do that, I don't want us to miss the overarching broad purpose of the book of Daniel. You see, the book of Daniel is not merely moral lessons for us, but it's rather an encouragement for God's people in the midst of exile. God's people have been taken away, away from their homeland. They've been conquered by a Gentile pagan king. And here they are in exile, and they need a word. They need encouragement. They need something to help them know what to think and do when they get up in the morning. And that's what the book of Daniel is going to do for them. Is it's not just a history of, of, of Judah in Babylon. It's, it's actually... Daniel telling God's story of how he is over all things. So as we consider some of the moral lessons, remember the main lesson, which is God is in control. God is in control. God is able to tear down and raise up, to bind and to loose, to judge and to show mercy. His kingdom is over all the kingdoms of the earth. His kingdom is what matters, and His kingdom is everlasting. So as we look through the text, we'll see three main things. In chapter 4, we'll see Nebuchadnezzar's pride. In chapter 5, we'll see Belshazzar's idolatry. And then we'll see this threat of judgment and thread of mercy, which goes through the whole passage. Let's pray again together. Oh God, we are in danger this morning. We're in danger of hearing but not heeding. We're in danger of being shown once more your greatness. To see one more time your works of salvation and mercy. And we're in danger of hardening our heart one more time. God, I pray for your mercy this morning here for us. That you would help us to see what we need to see, to hear what we need to hear. God, would you in your mercy allow us to humble ourselves under your word and under your kingship this very day. Lord, we thank you for your word, for your revelation of your will for us. What you desire for us, what you command to us. Help us, Lord, to not take that for granted. Help us to see your hand working in the midst of our own situations and trials. Give us the faith that we need to see that you're doing more than just one thing at a time as you work in our world. Help us to grasp that you're at work in our personal lives, in our families, in our communities, in our nation, and in the world to bring you glory. Lord, we sang of that glory this morning, that you reign forever and ever. So help us to lift our eyes to you as we hear your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've already read of Nebuchadnezzar's pride, or at least the beginning of it, in our chapter, in chapter 4. Now, it's interesting, but he actually, Nebuchadnezzar is going to speak here, and he's actually going to Give us the end before the beginning. So when you look at verses 1 through 3, you're actually seeing, I believe, you're seeing, you're hearing what Nebuchadnezzar would say after the events of chapter 4. John, why do you think that? Because, one, you might read that and think, oh, this sounds like it's actually the ending of chapter 3. Because at the end of chapter 3, when God delivers Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace, you see that... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar then begins praising God then. And you think, oh, well, chapter 4 looks like it should be the end of 3. But look at the end of verse 2 in chapter 4. It says, the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. You see, this isn't just Nebuchadnezzar realizing what God has done for others in chapter 4. It's actually going to be what God did for him. So he's going to tell us the end at the beginning. Now, in chapter 3, he witnessed some magnificent magnificent things about what God did for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
But those didn't quite lead him to the same place of exalted worship that he's going to offer to God at the end of the events in chapter 4. Now this opening, these opening few verses here in chapter 4 are not merely a personal reflection, though that would be helpful to see that Nebuchadnezzar, having gone through all of this, looks toward heaven and extols the majesty of God. That, That would be good for us to see, but if you'll notice... What the beginning of chapter 4 is, is a proclamation. It's actually sent out to all peoples, nations, and languages, basically commending the God of the Bible to them and commanding them to worship Him and how great He is. This is a, a pagan Gentile king evangelizing because what, have God, what God has done for him. We'll also want to notice that Daniel really portrays Nebuchadnezzar in a positive light throughout much of the book, which will be in contrast to what we see in chapter 5 with Belshazzar. Now, there are similarities to chapter 4 and chapter 2. If you think back to chapter 2, there's another scene, there's another dream, there's this request for interpretation, and then Daniel comes in and he interprets, and we'll see some of the same things here in chapter 4 as well. Another unique aspect of this is, I don't know if you noticed, I read through it many times before I really saw this, but this is, this is written in Nebuchadnezzar's first person voice. The first 18 verses, which Jake read, are all in Nebuchadnezzar's first person. And we're going to come back to that uh, at verse 34. So in the middle, we'll go back kind of to the narrator voice. But this first section is all narrated by Nebuchadnezzar himself. So what's the context of this dream, this dream that he has? When when does this happen? Verse 4 tells us, it says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. At ease and prospering. Maybe this is a warning to us, maybe not. But you see, God's going to bring a word of warning to Nebuchadnezzar when he's at ease, as he's resting as he's just thinking about as we'll see later all the things that he has accomplished now we don't know what time period in Nebuchadnezzar's reign this event takes place but he reigned from 605 BC to 562 BC 43 year reign and he was quite an accomplished king as we've already mentioned so whatever is going on in, the, in this particular season, things seem to be going well, and he is in spiritual danger. And there's a spiritual danger for us when things are going well. Proverbs 30 says this, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. So there's a real sense in which give us this day our daily bread. It's such a helpful prayer because it grounds us in the reality of who God is as our provider and who we are. But in the midst of Nebuchadnezzar's prosperity, God wants to get a message to him. And so the way God does this for Nebuchadnezzar is he sends him a dream. So what is in this dream? It's kind of strange. But there's a central image in the dream, and that is that of this huge tree, which reaches all the way to heaven, in a sense, and that all the people of the earth could see it. Now, this tree is not just alive. This tree is life-giving, and it provides shelter and food for those around it. In other words, this tree is portraying Nebuchadnezzar as a god, not just somebody powerful, but somebody who is life-giving. And as we think about this image of the tree, we hear echoes, don't we? Don't you hear echoes of Eden, the tree in the midst of the garden? Or do you hear echoes of the Tower of Babel as they build a tower to try to stretch between earth and heaven? Remember, this is Babel. We're in Babylon, the same city. And then this dream includes this watcher, this watcher, this, this angelic being who seems to be watching what's going on and is going to come down 
and cut down the tree. He didn't simply cut it down. As, and that would have been enough. But he cut it down. He lopped off all the branches. He stripped off all the leaves. He discarded all of the fruit so that it could no longer provide shelter or food. He demolished this tree. But in an unexpected turn, this angelic arborist, we'll call him, he leaves the stump and puts an iron band around it. So this has got Nebuchadnezzar flummoxed. What, what in the world does this dream mean? I've already said more than he knew at that time. So he calls, just like he did before, for all the magicians and enchanters and Chaldeans to come tell him what in the world does this dream mean? And of course, none of them can tell him. So he eventually calls Daniel, or at least Daniel eventually comes in into the story. And then we pick up the interpretation of the dream in verse 19. So you want to look there. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you. And it's a tree you saw, which grew and became strong, reached its top to heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth, whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in which was food for all, under which beasts of the field found shade, and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong and your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven, and your dominion to the ends of the earth. Strong word from the prophet Daniel here. Again, the, the text continues to put Nebuchadnezzar in a positive light. We're not exactly sure why Daniel was hesitant to share the interpretation, but I think we can guess. The text doesn't tell us, but it's not difficult to imagine it's difficult to advise and give hard news to the most powerful man on the earth. Now, we typically think of the President of the United States as being the most powerful man on the earth, but he has restrictions and accountability and laws that he follows. Not so for Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar can do whatever he wants. He can kill. He can do whatever he wants. So Daniel's hesitant. Nebuchadnezzar puts him at ease and says, it's fine. Just tell me what the dream is. Mean. So he continues his interpretation in verse 24. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord, the king, that you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And as was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from that time till you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. Now this is indeed a strange warning. Very strange warning. That he'll be driven into the wilderness to eat grass like an ox. Now some have tried to associate this particular behavior with a particular mental illness, and that's interesting to some degree, but I don't think that's the point of the passage. This is a particular judgment from God on a particular ruler in Babylon. But if you notice, Daniel actually has some hope, some hope that this could be averted, that this judgment can be avoided, and he doesn't necessarily speak to specific sins of of Nebuchadnezzar here, but he does mention things that good rulers should do. Practice righteousness. Practice righteousness and care for the oppressed. Show mercy to the oppressed. We don't actually know from the text 
if Nebuchadnezzar took these warnings to heart or not. And when we get to the next, to the next little bit in verse 28, we're going to see that this judgment is, in fact, going to come on to uh, Nebuchadnezzar after 12 months. But we don't know if these were 12 months of God just, I'm giving you a little bit more time, or if these are 12 months of Nebuchadnezzar on his best behavior and repentance, and then he went back to his old ways. Look in verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of his royal palace in Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? And while the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. So it did take 12 months, so a year after the original dream, God is going to bring judgment. It appears again that the king was at his leisure, things were going well. See, it's often not when we're struggling that we struggle in our relationship with God. It's often when things are going well that we struggle in our relationship with God. And God is going to confront him for this pride that he has. So in what way is he showing pride? There's a great chapter in Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis called The Great Sin. Here's one of his statements about pride. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good-looking, but they are not. They're proud of being richer or cleverer or better-looking than others. If everyone else became equally rich or clever or good-looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. It is the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. See, Nebuchadnezzar was boasting about the things that he had done. But he wasn't just boasting in that. He was boasting in the glory that that should bring him. So Lewis is bringing out this idea that, that pride in its essence is about our comparison. Our comparison with others, or perhaps in Nebuchadnezzar's case, our his comparison of himself with a deity. What about, what about us? Where does, where does pride find a resting place in our own heart as we compare ourselves to others? This is dangerous, dangerous stuff for us. This temptation goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. You will be like God. This comparison. And of course, one of the great challenges for the sin of pride is that we so quickly and easily see the sin of pride in other people, and so rarely and deeply see it in ourselves. So verse 33 says, immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. So instead of Nebuchadnezzar humbling himself, God humbles him to the point of humiliation. He's not merely lowered below like other kings. He's, he's actually lowered below humanity itself with the life of a beast. Now, this is not the end for Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, there's still a stump in the dream. There's, there's an iron band around the stump. We don't really know what that's supposed to signify. Is that, is that somehow how he's going to be bound in this condition for seven years? Or is it that his, his kingdom is going to be kept safe until he returns to his senses? We're, we're not sure but regardless, God is not done with Nebuchadnezzar yet. This, this pagan Gentile king, which exalted himself above, above the gods that he knew, 
And even after seeing some of the some of the powerful deeds of the true one true God of heaven, he lifts himself up and God's going to bring him down. And then in verse 34, we see a change. At the end of days, now we don't we don't know how many days. It said seven times, so most commentaries say seven years. It was long enough for him to get really long fingernails and really long hair, but I don't I don't know. At the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation And all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? And at the same time, my reason returned to me, and for for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me, and my counselors and lords sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. What a testimony of a man met by God and restored. Do you see the, the key moments in his restoration? See, here's a man who, in his pride, could, could never really look up to anything. He didn't even see anyone as his equal. He was always looking down. And it took seven years of, being, of living like an animal. And he lifts his eyes to heaven. He doesn't put his eyes on his circumstances. He doesn't put his eyes on others. He lifts his eyes to heaven. He looks up. And perhaps for the first time, he truly acknowledges that God is king over all. God is above him in glory and majesty and greatness. And God in his mercy returned the king's reason to him. See, the two turning points, he lifted his eyes to heaven and his, and his reason returned to him. His reason returned. He could make sense of the world again. Well, that was Nebuchadnezzar's pride that brought him very low, and yet God raised him up when he humbled himself. In chapter 5, we're going to see some similarities and some differences. So look in chapter 5 with me. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought And that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. And they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. This is not going to go well for Belshazzar. Now, this is quite an abrupt change from the last chapter. It's unexplained by the writer how we got from Nebuchadnezzar to Belshazzar. Nebuchadnezzar is now out of the picture, and this new ruler is Belshazzar. And the history is very interesting and quite complicated. And I'll just give you briefly uh, some of the aspects. So this was at least 23 years after the death of Nebuchadnezzar. So from chapter 4 to chapter 5, was at a minimum 23 years. So after the death of Nebuchadnezzar, it was 23 years before the events of this chapter take place. So after ruling for 43 years, Nebuchadnezzar dies, 
in 562, and there were several rulers actually between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, which are not brought into this story. So it's helpful for us to remember that this account is not a history of Babylon and all of its doings. It is a particular story told in a particular way about true events to inspire and help the people of God while they're under persecution and captivity. So Nebuchadnezzar's main sin was pride. He, he exalted himself and lifted himself up. Belshazzar's was idolatry. Now we'll see blasphemy. So he, he takes these golden and silver utensils that were brought out of the temple in Jerusalem. So Nebuchadnezzar did that. But we have no record of Nebuchadnezzar committing idolatry in this same way with these vessels. So, he's, so, so Belshazzar is throwing this huge party, 1,000 people for this party, which in fact was not a great idea to do while the army of your enemy is approaching the city. Just saying, that's usually not when you should throw a big party. So he's throwing this party for 1,000 people. He calls for the golden vessels. Not only do they drink from them, these vessels which were only meant to be used for worship in the temple in Jerusalem. So not only do they drink from them, but as they're drinking in these vessels wine, they profane them by praising their own false gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. So as they're drinking in God's holy vessels, they're praising false gods. Now, last week, Phil mentioned that um, in his sermon from chapter 3, that sometimes it's hard for us to relate to the sin of idolatry. I mean, we don't typically raise our glass to the God of gold or silver or iron or stone or wood. We don't usually physically bow down to them. But in this context, when you think about what's happening, they're actually not bowing down to these false gods. They're celebrating and attributing their success to these things. So they're celebrating and attributing success to the gods of gold, silver, stone, wood, bronze, iron, etc. Now this isn't that far from us to imagine. We, We can imagine celebrating the things which we think make us successful in ways that give more glory to those things than they actually deserve. How about liberty, autonomy, economy, political power, technical innovation? All of these things, when we're sitting around yucking it up, drinking a beer or some wine, can become some of the things that we attribute success to and that we put stock in as far as what makes us happy people. This is not that far off from what Belshazzar was doing. So, Belshazzar's throwing a big party. The enemy, the enemy is outside the gate. We don't know if he knew that or not, but he should have known it. And something happens. Something significant happens. It's not the enemy yet. So at this point, look at verse 5. God doesn't speak to him through a dream, but something quite more sinister Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him and his limbs gave way and his knees were knocking together. This is an awkward moment. This is an awkward moment for Belshazzar. So he is terrified. So if you think of some circumstance where you would be terrified, this is it for Belshazzar. And um, goosebumps, fear, like all the fight or flight emotions would be going on through him. And in fact, the Aramic is a bit interesting in verse 6, for his limbs gave way. That's not a very accurate translation. It literally says, the knots of his loins were loosed. (laughs) I'm just saying, it's quite possible that he messed his pants in this moment. <laughs> just think of it. Think of, that, think of that moment where a hand, a hand is just writing a bodiless hand on the wall. And it's bad enough that there's a handwriting on the wall. That's scary. It's awkward. 
but they don't know what it means. They don't know what it says. So like his father, Nebuchadnezzar, he calls for all the magicians, the wise men, the Chaldeans, the astrologers, anybody who could tell him what this means, and none of them could. None of them could. It's not a surprise to us as we're reading the story, but just think how desperate this makes him as a ruler. Verse 9, this is after they, they cannot interpret it. The king Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, and his color changed, and his lords were perplexed. And then the queen, and this is perhaps the queen mother, his, his wives were already there, so this is perhaps the queen mother, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall, and the queen declared, O king, live forever. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Uh, l- let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There is a man, there is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father, the king, made him chief of all the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers, because an excellent spirit Knowledge, understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show you the interpretation. Now, we're not sure why Daniel wasn't called with the earlier wise men, but remember, this is 23 years at least after Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel at this point is either somewhere between 80 and 85 years old. And it's possible that Belshazzar didn't really want the guy who was around when Nebuchadnezzar became like living like a beast. Like it's possible he wasn't really a fan. But eventually in verse 13, Daniel was brought before the king. And the king answered and said to Daniel, you are Daniel. You're that Daniel. Now, Daniel means the God who judges, right? One of the exiles of Judah, whom the king, my father, brought from Judah. I've heard of you, that the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now, in some ways, I want to read this as if Belshazzar is being positive toward Daniel. But part of me really thinks he's saying something like, oh, you're that Daniel. You're one of those exiles of the Jews that we conquered and brought from Judah. I've heard of you. But he does He has heard some things. So what is Daniel going to do, this 80 or 85-year-old man, going to do for Belshazzar? Well, like any old man, he's going to give him a history lesson and then tell him what he wants to know. (laughs) So, sorry. We've honored older people in in the church, and I really appreciate that. I need history lessons. I'm just saying... So verse 17, Daniel answered and says before the king, let your gifts be for yourself. He doesn't want the king's gifts. And give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and make known to him the interpretation. Verse 18, O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. Notice who gave it to him? The Lord most high. And because the greatness that he gave him, all peoples and nations and languages trembled and feared before him, and whom he would he killed, and whom he would he kept alive, whom he would he raised up, and whom he would he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened and he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne, and his glory was taken away from him. Verse 22, and you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and your lords, and your wives, and your concubines, and you've drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver, and gold, and bronze, and iron, and wood, and stone, which do not see, or hear, or know. But the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored. 
This is before he even tells him what it means. It's a stinging rebuke. It doesn't have the same flavor of patience that Daniel had with Nebuchadnezzar. I wonder if Daniel didn't have the same respect for this young ruler who didn't seem to be doing anything other than partying. But the key for us is verse 22. So please, this is a warning for us. It's a warning for me. You have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. See, knowledge was not enough for Belshazzar. So you could say, you should have known better. But actually, it's you do know better, and yet you did not change. This is a danger to us who have such a rich heritage of hearing God's word preached and proclaimed, of knowing God's will and knowing God's commands and knowing God's expectations of those who would follow him as disciples. Do not deceive, we must not deceive ourselves into thinking that God will not hold us to account to do according to what we know is true. So Daniel does give it the interpretation, which the other wise men could not do in verse 24. So this is when the hand was sent, and this is the writing as was inscribed. Verse 25, this is the writing that was inscribed, many, many, tekel, and parson. This is the interpretation of the matter, many. God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. In Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. We're not entirely sure why the wise men of the Chaldeans couldn't read this. It would have been in Aramaic. But it seems there were three words, and each of the words had three letters. And if you read them as nouns, it's just units of money going from larger to smaller. Daniel seems to apply different vowels to these consonants and read them as verbs and kind of makes a word play out of them to come up with a different meaning that is one of judgment on Belshazzar. One commentary kind of says it this way, God has Belshazzar's number. He's a lightweight, and his kingdom will split, or in short, you are finished, flimsy, and fractured. That may be a little too cavalier. But God, God has looked down and numbered Belshazzar's days. In other words, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. He's been weighed and found wanting. Perez or Parson is, sounds like the same word for Persia, which is about to come and take over. So what happened next? He's received this warning. He, he actually gives to Daniel the robe and the power, third, third in the kingdom. It's likely that Belshazzar was actually a co-regent and not actually the king. His father was the king. So third in power would have been Daniel. Not that it really matters because, well, look what's going to happen. So in verse 30, that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Now, why does he give us the age of Darius? We're not sure, but it's been about 62 years at this point since Babylon took Judah captive. So it's almost like Daniel saying, oh, by the way, he was born when you took over. God's been preparing Darius to take this kingdom away since it started. God rules over all things. He rules over all kingdoms. God is in charge. And one of the ironies is that Belshazzar was holding a huge feast while his enemies were knocking at the door. So eventually the Medes, they... They divert part of the river, come in through the wall, take over. So there's this threat of judgment throughout this passage for both Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. 
this threat that if you don't repent, if you don't turn, if you don't change your ways, judgment is coming. And we see in Nebuchadnezzar, God lowered him so low that he had to look up and God restored him. But we see with Belshazzar that God had numbered his days and brought judgment. He did not know tonight is the night. I'm going to take your life. But not only is there a threat of judgment, I, what I want us to consider as we close here is there's a thread of mercy that just goes all throughout this passage. There's mercy through providence. God, God puts people in the place where he needs them and he, where he wants to use them. And all of the things that were going on in Nebuchadnezzar's life or in Belshazzar's life or in Daniel's life or in the lives of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, throughout all the kingdom, God is moving things in his providence for his glory and majesty. God's, God's working through a pagan king who is the king of the most powerful empire that the world had known to that point. God shows mercy through his providence. God also shows mercy through revelation. You see, in, in both of these kings' lives, God sends a message. God sends a message that they should pay attention to and listen to and heed and obey. And this is God's mercy. God did not have to do that. God could have simply brought judgment on them because of their sin, but instead he speaks. Then God brings his mercy through prophetic warnings. Here's Daniel, this 85-year-old man, probably mostly discarded, who brings a message that Belshazzar needs to hear. A message that if he heeded could have changed the course of his life and eternity. God sent a messenger through Daniel. It was his mercy. God sent his mercy through different, to difficulties and discipline. We see that in Nebuchadnezzar's life. So we may think, wow, that would be miserable to, to eat like an ox for, for seven years and to barely be a man. And yet that is the thing that God used to bring Nebuchadnezzar back to his senses and to acknowledge that he is not the king, God is the king. So we need to remember in those moments in our lives when we think God is against me, God is not for me, God is disciplining me, this is hard. Can we remember what Nebuchadnezzar remembered later? God brought him low so that he would look up and see God working and acknowledge God as good and king and sovereign over all things. Friend, it may be true that in your life you feel like God is pressing you down, but will you please consider that he's doing that so that you'll look up and respond to his mercy. God showed his mercy through a tree. Not this tree, not, not Nebuchadnezzar's tree. There's another tree that stands between heaven and earth, the cross of Christ, which bridges this gap between God and man. There's mercy in this other tree where Jesus laid down his life. He condescended, much like Nebuchadnezzar was lowered. Jesus lowered himself to become obedient to the point of death on the cross so that we might be brought to God in heaven. There is a tree, friend, and there is another king. There is a king that's not Nebuchadnezzar, and it's not Belshazzar. There is a king which invites us. He invites us into his kingdom. He invites us into his family. King Jesus, who reigns forever and ever and ever. So how should we respond to a message like this? Well, again, the main overarching message of Daniel is God reigns. Do not put your hope do not put your hope in earthly kingdoms. It's not the Democrats. It's not in the Republicans. It's not in the United States of America. God's purposes are above and beyond those parameters. Don't put your hope in political power. That's the overarching theme. No matter who's in power, God's people have a calling to be holy and faithful. And God is holy and faithful. Number two, fight against pride. We see it in Nebuchadnezzar. 
We don't so easily see it in ourselves. I, I wonder if you were like me as you're reading this about Nebuchadnezzar and you're noticing his pride and you're being critical of his pride. And then God shows you, wait, if you're critical of others and their pride, chances are you need to look in the mirror, see the pride in yourself. And of course, we need to be aware of idolatry and not just Not just theological idolatry, but the functional idolatry where we place our hopes, we place our pleasures, we place our stability in the things that this world offers. Oh friend, let's put our hope in God. Let's put our treasure in heaven and not on earth where moth and rust corrupts and thieves break in and steal. And finally, let's lift our eyes like Nebuchadnezzar did to heaven. Lift our eyes up. In the end, Nebuchadnezzar had to take his eyes off his accomplishments, off his peers, and look up. That's what we need to do as well. In the Gospel of John, he says this, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. Friend, remember, we are no more promised tonight than Belshazzar. We are no more promised that we'll live to tomorrow than he was. And our sins are no less egregious than his. God showed mercy to him by giving him a chance to repent. And God shows mercy to us. Will you look to Christ? Let's pray. O oh God, you are able to bring low the proud. You oppose the proud, but you give grace to the humble. God, help us. Help me. Help us to humble ourselves before you and before others. God, help us even just today to look for ways to purposefully humble ourselves, to serve you, to acknowledge you as king to serve others, to acknowledge they're made in your image. And God, help us to lift up our eyes off of our circumstances, off of our accomplishments, off of our value and worth or our rights and onto the King who lives forever and ever, who reigns above all things, who will reign forever and ever. And we praise your name. Amen.